Welcome to the Master Dealmaker's Secrets Podcast. And now, here's sales growth strategist, John Blake. Welcome to Master Dealmaker's Secrets. I'm John Blake. Uh, and as I said before, we have Mark Matthews with us today. Now, to give you a bit of background, Mark has made a living achieving the unfathomable, crossing the internet intersection of danger and excitement. He knows all too well the crippling grasp of fear. While surfing in Tasmania, 15 feet in front of a cliff in cold, shark-infested waters, Mark hit a reef and instantly blacked out. So terror engulfed every inch of his being, uh, as you can imagine. Being blacked out underwater is really not a place that you would ever want to end up. Um, He had his neck braced and he was hospital-ridden. He didn't know if he was ever going to surf again. And at that moment, Mark made a decision to never allow fear to overpower him again. So he's deconstructed, fine-tuned and personalized emotion and resilience techniques to successfully strengthen one's mindset and sustain long-term performance. And these techniques have helped him to win an unprecedented three consecutive Oakley Big Wave Awards and cement Mark as one of the best big wave surfers in the world, which is no mean feat as uh, someone um, like myself who's been surfing for 40 years. There are some incredibly crazy people out there surfing incredibly stupidly massive waves. Out there. So if, to be known as that is, is massive. But um, Mark, mate, stoked to have you on the podcast, mate. How are you? Stoked to be on the podcast, mate. <laughs> cool. So, um, so mate, um, really, really psyched to get stuck into this because, you know, in, in business and in, in sales, you know, fear is definitely a factor. You know, there's, there's all sorts of fears around, um, you know, even just before as we were talking, you know, asking people to pay your fee, you know, even just stating your fee in, in, in the sales conversation can be really confronting for people. Yeah, and, there's no hiding in sales, right? It's nah, like, you know, there's... Fear of failure people, is so real because it's so measurable, like you're successful or you're not. At that, like, yeah. I mean, a lot of other aspects in the corporate world, you can kind of hide. But I feel like when I deal with sales audiences, it's like, man, you're on the front line. It's like, it's tough to blame, you know, like you can't really pass off the blame too much. No, it's a, no you, yeah, you, it's you, a tough, you really can't. Tough it's, game to it, be in. It is, and and it's it's yeah, it's it's really, it's it's really not, um, you know, because it is so, so quantitative, you know, you're either making sales or you're not, <laughs> you know, and and at the end of the month, you know, that was that, that's why I you know I use the the phoenix as my as my brand is like, at the end of the month, you you pretty much die a metaphorical death, and and you're reborn on the first of, the first day of the next month. I love and, it. And, and you've, got to re, you've got to be reborn. You know, you've got to come up with new ideas. You've got to come up with new people to talk to. You're going to have new challenges. Um, you know, that's why the Phoenix is, is, is you know, is, is my brand. I actually don't talk about that that much, but that's, that's why. I love so, that. It's so true. Yeah. It's like you've got to wash off any sort of past failure that might have happened the month before. Yeah. All the, all the turndowns and, and get yourself back on the horse. And or, that's or past thing. successes. Yeah, past you know what I mean. Like just because you had a good month, it, yeah. like last month, <laughs> yeah. this month so doesn't true. care. You know, so true. <laughs> so, um, so look, what what is in your experience? Because you, you've obviously you know delved deeper into this this subject than you know certainly anyone I know, but but anyone around that, that I can even think of. You know, what are the three biggest misconceptions around fear? Um, I think. I think one that definitely always comes about is that you can live a life hiding from fear. Like you can live a completely comfortable life and you, if you just avoid all the things that you're scared of, mm-hmm. you know, and, and that's sustainable. I think that's a misconception. I don't think you can live a life without fear. Like it's, it's kind of impossible because the, the fear and the danger and all the things that you're scared of will find you eventually, you know, like it's like if you create a comfort zone around yourself, you've got to think of that comfort zone. Like it might be where you're operating in right now in whatever aspect of your life. So that comfort zone, you've got to think of it as though it's slowly shrinking 
and the walls are creeping in because that's kind of what is happening as the world changes, you know, the world and the environment constantly changing around you. So that has to mean that your comfort zone's got to shrink because you've got to adapt to the changing world all the time. So the, the first misconception would definitely be that you can just avoid fear and it shouldn't be a part of life. It's like fear, stress and anxiety is like the basis of human existence. You know? And then it's what do you do from there? You know, you start out terrified, scared of everything because you're so vulnerable. So what are we going to do about it? I think, you know, that's the first misconception. Um, I think one that I always come across and, and I was, I battled with this early when I was kind of at, at this, the sort of start of my career because I started out, uh, you know, like I start, when I started surfing, I was never like, I wasn't born fearless. That's a misconception that people think when they look at me, it's like, Oh, there must be something tweaked in him that, that makes him just not scared about things. And that's why he can do what he can do. But that's not true at all. Like I was terrified of the ocean when I was a kid, like so terrified that my mum used to have to paddle out and rescue me all the time when I was a little kid. And, and I mean, I grew up in a, in a, a pretty rough, tough neighborhood in, in Sydney called Maroubra beach. Yeah. And man, when your mum paddles out on her boogie board to rescue you in front of all your friends, it's, oh, no. <laughs> it's a pretty embarrassing experience. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not like I was born with something that helped me deal with fear. Um, and what I learned over time is that, the the best tool to deal with fear is just experience you know and and it's the skill set that you build as you get experience so it's like little by little putting your, your foot across that comfort a comfort zone into the unfamiliar environment just a little bit at a time and building these new skill set that then make that environment that used to be scary to you not so scary anymore and it that like and then that then becomes a constant question of motivation because you've got to push yourself to do that you know so then it's like it's smart to to figure out how to motivate yourself to take on you know that constant feeling of anxiety so you can build the skill set and then not be so scared anymore and then all of a sudden i think what happens is that the things that you were terrified of that made you anxious that gave you sleepless nights eventually something switches in you as the skill set you, you master the skill set something switches and it's like all of a sudden all those things are now exciting to you more than they are anxiety provoking there's like this this shift because you're like oh that, that that's like an exciting environment where i can now test my skills in and see if i can overcome you know all the the difficulties in that environment so so there's that that shift and i think the misconception that i'm in a roundabout way trying to get to is that that the the different sort of cognitive stress relief techniques so if you think of like there's in, in modern psychology is like the cognitive behavioral therapy techniques there's like meditation and all these stress relief techniques that are amazing but i don't think that they work to help you deal with scary environments if you don't have the skills first like they're kind of useless without the skill set. And a lot of people go straight for the like relaxation, stress relief technique when they should be putting more time into building the skill set that they need in that environment. Because that's really where the majority of the benefit of overcoming fear and stress is going to come from, is just being really good at what you do in that world. And then it's like, then those tools like the stress relief, the meditation and the cognitive behavioral therapy and all these different tools are kind of great add-ons to help you while you're building your skill set. So I think, I mean, that, that misconception is that you just need to do those, those, like you just need to meditate to be less anxious. Well, not really, because I, I can take a guru meditator who meditates all day, every day, and bring him out in 20 foot waves and he's going to be terrified. Like there's no <laughs> way about it. And you, you can take me who, who's like, like I can surf huge waves and not be terrified and put me into your sales environment and I'll be nervous as all shit because I don't have those skills, you know? Mm. So you need the skills first. That's, yeah. and I think that gets overlooked. I think more than, than most things, the, the other anxiety, relaxing techniques and meditation stuff are great add ons 
while you build the skill set, but they don't make up for a lack of skill is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, in a yeah. Roundabout way. And so that's two. Uh, what would be the third? Um, I think the third, it, maybe it's the... I think that what also gets overlooked is that a lot of your fear and anxiety it, like is born out from your subconscious, like the way your subconscious reacts to environments and it's not front of mind for you. You know, so you may like think that certain environments or things don't stress you out but actually your body is stressed out in that environment, but they might not be front of mind. Does that make sense? So it's like, mm. because like, so you can say, um, a lot of people will go like, I'm not a competitive person, you know, like I, I, I just, I don't like competing cause it's just not my thing. I like to just, um, go with the flow and, and, and not compete. But the reality is, if you dig deep, they don't like competing because they don't like losing, you know, because that stresses people out if you lose in a competitive environment. And you can't detach competition from life. It's just not possible. Like you can't, you can't pull it out. It's everywhere. So it's kind of like a lot of the stress and the anxiety is, is happening to you all the time even though you're not necessarily aware of it and even though you may come up with things in your mind saying oh but it's not that that's stressing me it's like it's this you know but it's actually you know you got to dig deep and face the things that you're like that are really tough to look at about yourself and that's most likely where the fear and the stress and the anxiety is actually coming from so it's uh i think that gets probably overlooked a little bit as well I don't know if that made sense. It was hard to explain off the top of my head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, look, there's there's a couple of things that really jumped out at me um, from from what you were just saying. The the, the first one is that um, you know, just like that um, that Pearl Jam song, <laughs> that that which you fear the most could meet you halfway. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like if you think you're just gonna, you know, put a, you know, bundle yourself up in cotton wool and never have to confront anything you're probably well you are kidding yourself because the world's going to change and at some point you're going to be standing there and you're actually going to be surrounded <laughs> exactly i mean i know nothing highlights it more than what just happened like with a pandemic like yeah you might have been unbelievably comfortable in your role at whatever job that you were doing and it's like blink of an eye that industry's wiped out for for a year for two years yeah like, yeah so it's it'll find you you know you've yeah. got to continuously update and evolve and push and build skills to to manage whatever change might be around the corner it's almost like you know what one of the things that i that, that i that i'm sometimes um become mindful of is that if you don't challenge yourself the world will create challenges for you that's it couldn't be more spot on. Yeah. Um, and so, and, and then the other thing that, um, that jumped out at me was, um, cause, um, I don't know if you know, but I actually lived in Maroubra for a couple of years. <laughs> and so I know exactly what you're talking about <laughs> <laughs> in terms of surfing out, surfing at Maroubra and having your mum come out and go, <laughs> you okay, Mark? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Still can't live it now. Actually, um, what, one of the most scary things I did when I lived in Maroubra was um, I used to I used to sing in a punk band at, and we used to play at the Maroubra Bay Hotel. Oh, mate! <laughs> <laughs> with um, with uh, w- with this band, and, and the first time we played, what the um, the bass player said to me, "Look, um, it's not unusual for, for um, bands to have cans thrown at them." So he said, Where, bring your mouth guard and your helmet. Just. Yeah, he said if you if you see, and he just, he just said, look, if you see a can like being thrown at, you just duck. <laughs> I was like, oh right, oh. And just and believe it's a, a positive thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thankfully, we never got anything thrown at us. Yeah, it um, must have been pretty good then. But that was, you know, that was in the early nineties, so that was was still pretty rough back then. I think, yeah, that was kind of it was rough. Yeah, and not for much longer than that. I think nah. that's probably the, the peak of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that you know there was still a few drive-bys and you know some of those crazy things happening. 
Um, and then the other thing that, that that you that you said that really jumped out at me was um, was the skill set. So it's like it's like you know mitigating risk and and preparing for the worst case scenario and saying okay, well if if, if that happens, then I've got this you know this set of contingencies in place. Yeah. And and now working back from that, it's like okay, well what can I do to make sure that none of those things happen. How, how can I best prepare? Cause you'll never be a hundred percent prepared because there's stuff that you just don't have any control over, but what can I control in terms of mitigating, mitigating risk? Um, and, and then, like you said, then work on the preparation stuff, the mindset stuff, the, yeah, exactly. You well, know, this, the, this is like how it happens for me in surfing. And then it's also in speaking because when for public speaking for me, learning to be, become a public speaker was more anxiety provoking and stressful than learning to become a big wave surfer because wow. like I'm highly, highly introverted. And so for me, that's terrifying. And as far as like having the work, the lowest level of skill set to go into an industry, like I could, I can't at school, I couldn't even read from a book without stuttering in front of a classroom. Like that's oh, my wow. experience of any sort of public speaking. Of skill yeah. To public speaking. Yeah. So it was the most foreign thing for me to be able to do. <clears throat> um, but what I notice, and it's so in, in surfing, the way it happens is I see a swell forecast. So I check the internet every morning. I can see swell maps from all around the world. And then I, when you see a huge swell out in say the, the Indian ocean or something, and, and it's a, I know then that there's going to be huge waves, say, off the coast of Western Australia um, in seven days' time. So the reality is that in seven days' time, I'm going to be surfing massive waves that could kill me. And so as soon as that happens, like that forecast, like it's like a, a TV gets switched on in the back of my head and, and the TV just plays a constant stream of thoughts of, of exactly all the different things of how I might die in a week's time when I go surfing, like all those things just play out. And it's just crazy, like stress that I, if that, that's there for that week of just constantly visuals of drowning sharks, like all the things that can go wrong. And, and I always just, I, I figured like originally it's like, I've got to like do the meditation and stuff to not listen to it. Right. So if you meditate and you can nestle yourself in the present moment that, that you don't, have to uh get affected by that 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 stream of negative thoughts which is the a great concept but i never found it completely possible to be able to do that i found it so difficult what i found i found that actually quieten those thoughts down or turn the volume down on that tv more was that i would just take what was playing out in my head and i just every given situation of things that could go wrong, I'd just prepare for that specific thing. So if it was me being held under by huge waves for too long where I'd black out, I would be like, okay, when that happens, this is what's going to go on. And I'd prepare my safety team. It's like you have everything in place for what happens. You know, if I'm down for that long, what are you guys going to do? If I come up and I'm uh, like, I float up, I'm unconscious. Like, tell me the plan of what you do. You take me to this boat, you get me to land in this time. You start resuscitation. You might have a defibrillator on the beach. You, you're going to call for this helicopter to get you. And just uh, the more meticulous I could be about the safety, that's what quieted the thought to stand more than anything else. Or whether it was like, training myself physically to be able to hold my breath longer you know that the more confident you become there then the, the the bad thoughts slowly quieten down and i think that's the like building the skill set and putting the plans in place to mitigate the risk to then alleviate some of the anxiety and then it it, it comes to that tipping point where it's like okay i've done as much preparation as i can do you know i've, I've gone through it and then if there is still negative thoughts i'm getting caught up in then that's where the meditation or taking your mind off it or doing whatever hobby you can do to stop thinking more about it you know but you've got yeah. to do the preparation otherwise yeah. you just, that anxiety will creep up yeah and and that's... then that was the same in in public speaking it's like i've got to have an escape plan for everything that could go wrong on stage and over like the now like a few hundred talks that i've given everything wrong that could have happened has pretty much happened. Like 
the whole AV system can crash while you're up on stage. You've got no slides, videos, anything. So it's like, well, when I was nervous about that, it's like, okay, I've got to learn to do my keynote with no assets, no videos, no thing. And if I can learn how to do that, then I don't have to worry too much if that happens. I've had like fire alarms go off while I'm, I'm speaking. Like the, the, all those different things have gone wrong, but it's just like, if you're prepared for them, then you don't have to be as anxious. You're still going to be nervous, but it's not crippling. Yeah. Know? And then when you actually just over and over again, you get on stage and you do it and you get good reactions from the audience and you master your skills, then it just slowly becomes more exciting yeah. to, to go out and do it. I think. Yeah. Yeah. That's so true. And, and that was, you know, certainly my experience, you know, when I first started doing, I mean, I, you know, as, as I mentioned before, I'd, I'd fronted a, um, you know, a, a punk band. Um, so I wasn't, you know, scared to get up in front of a group of people, but, um, but yeah, speaking to start off with, yeah, it started off being, being nerve wracking. And then after a while, it'd just be exciting. Yeah. But, but, but how much easier is it to speak when you, when you don't have that layer of anxiety, um, you know, a, around you, you can think so much um, better on your feet and your, oh, it's crazy. you can be but so like much for me, more. So that, that anxiety would make me blank out on stage, you know, like it, it, yeah. it's a point where the, the nerves are too bad and then I wouldn't know what's next. Yes. And, and I would know that that's going to happen. So it's like, I just have a line that I can go to. That's like, it's not necessarily exactly on topic of what I'm talking about. I can always use this one line when I blank out. Yeah. You know, when my mind goes blank, I can always do this. And, and then that, and then from there, while I'm telling that I can get back on track. Yeah. You know, it's just, just having that one line then stops me being so nervous that when my mind goes blank, because yeah. it happens all the time. It's like it freezes for a moment. But if you then get really anxious that your mind's frozen, it just perpetuates it. But if you have that escape route, it's like my mind freezes. I know I can go on the escape route, but then it comes back on track. Before yeah, yeah. I go on the escape route, you know, like, so it just settles it down enough. And like you said, it's like, it becomes enjoyable when you, you can start to think clearly under that pressure. It's uh, yeah. It's a nice- yeah and, and you can start to also, um, you can also start to get a feel for what's happening in your audience. Yeah. So, you know, so, you, you know, so you can make sure that you're, you know, that you're bringing them along with, you know, with, with, with what it is that you're talking ab- about and, and being receptive to the energy in the room. Whereas yeah. if you're all up in your head, you're not aware of any of that. Exactly. It's yeah. so true. Yeah. That took me a long time to get to that point. Yeah. And, th- and that, that's what that, that, that's what, when that layer of anxiety dissipates or, or at least lowers to a certain level, that's what, that, that's what it allows you to do, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's so true. Yeah. No, it's interesting. I, Cause I've, what, what I've noticed, you know, you talked about, you know, having to talk, um, you know, and, and read in front of the class, you know, I, I've had, and, and I, I worked this out a long time ago is that if I, if I, if I picked on somebody in a group to, to volunteer something or to role play or to, or, or to speak, um, or, or even just share, you know, what they were getting, um, from, from the session, if that person was, was that, you know, that high anxiety person that just had that horrible, um, neuro association with public speaking with, you know, that, that, four-year-old Clark, you know, year four classroom speaking in front of the group of people and stuttering or whatever. If I picked on that person to talk or role play or whatever, they wouldn't just resent, they wouldn't just be upset and they wouldn't just resent me. They would hate me forever. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, English teachers that I hate still to this day. <laughs> yeah. They, they're going to collapse that, that situation. Yeah. With, with, you know, Mr. Smithers who made me talk in front of everyone when I was, you know, when, when I was so uncomfortable. So well, that that's like exactly what the psychologists were like any good clinical psychologist worth his salt understands that the only real way to overcome fear is their technique called voluntary exposure therapy. It's not like, there has to be the voluntary in it. Like you have to volunteer yourself to take on the scary environment. Yep. When, when you're pushed and forced to do it, your body reacts differently. Like yep. it, that it's kind of like a, um, like a predator prey response, right? So like 
if you're choosing to go and do something and put yourself in that situation and it's of your own volition, then you're taking on the responsibility. So your nervous system is reacting more in the way of what a hunter would or a predator, you know, it's way more resilient. But if you're forced by someone to go and do that, then it's like you switch into like a, a, a prey response in your nervous system. And they're ancient responses that are just like built into you. And when I, I work with um, managers and, and then people going into senior leaderships, it's like, that's what they have to understand. It's like, w- what are you turning your employees into? Like a whole pack of prey animals that are just stressed out and anxious all the time. Or are you giving them the tools to want to take on these new roles and push themselves and then you're turning them into a pack of hunters, you know, and you're exponentially more resilient in that sort of frame. And you can, you can test it like physiologically the, the way the nervous system functions differently. So then it always ends up back at a question of motivation. <laughs> like it's like as yeah. long as you want it more than you fear it, then you will take that voluntary step, you know. Yeah, I love that. You need to you need to want it more than you fear it. So, so sometimes I'll get I'll get called into um, organisations where the because of the particular technical um, uh, you know the the, the the technical role that they have is that the, the predisposition is is not a sales predisposition. So if you've oh, got a room full of yeah. room full of accountants or a room full of engineers. Yeah, software and, engineers is kind of the ones I always. Yeah, with, and 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 yeah. and the and suddenly that you know somebody in management or an owner has decided that you know they've they've read a book or gone to see a seminar and they've decided that everybody in this organisation needs to be in sales. Yeah. So I need to teach every single person in this room how to be a salesperson. Now, building on what it is that you just said, if you're an engineer and you firstly don't. Um, identify yourself as a salesperson uh two you have some sort of mistrust or distaste or dislike for for anyone in that profession and you have absolutely no motivation whatsoever to become that person there is absolutely no way in the world that you're going to get that person to actually do anything no that, and, that and even the stress level about being forced into it is it will just be exponential. Yeah, like, it'll, and then they'll burn out quicker than. Yeah, anyone. absolutely. They will. The, you know, they will. Um, they will resist you at, at every step of the way. Yeah, it has to be their choice. Absolutely. So, so people say to me, you know, can, can you know, can a great, can, you know, can you, can you train somebody to be a, a good salesperson? Right. So I, I get that asked all the time. You know, are, are great salespeople born or are they made? And it's like, well, yes, I can train somebody to be a good salesperson, but they must want to become mm. a great salesperson. If yeah. they don't, then I am wasting my breath. Yeah, yeah, and it's and, so and, true. and and everyone's time and everyone's cash. Yeah, there's so, definitely like people are born with different genetic temperaments, like personality trait temperaments, and you know, an introverted person who's who enjoys dealing with things more than people, so they go down that route where they they may be an engineer. And they enjoy tinkering with things and, and creating things, and they're not that fascinated by people, and they 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 don't they're not craving attention from people. Like, and then they spend their whole life doing that up until they're like forty years old, and then they want the manager wants to force them to go that way. Yeah, good luck with that. Yeah, <laughs> it's tough. not going like, to work. But like, it's possible if they want to do it, because it's like for me, like um, I like I would never like public speaking is so against kind of my natural predisposition mm. like sort of temperament wise you know and so for me it's it's probably way more stressful for me being on stage than it is like a highly extroverted person who loves being the center of attention but yeah. it's still possible for me to do it i've just got to manage the amount of stress that i'm going to get from it you know yeah. and and in my head i'm like well the reward's so great, you know, like to do it. Like it's, mm. it's a, a, one, it's a phenomenal reward to be able to help people and inspire people. And the feedback I get, like it's, that makes it worth it. But on top of that, financially, it's like ridiculous, you know, the reward. And that's similar than when you go from 
masterful engineer into sales like in a lot of different companies that there's higher rewards financially in in sales a lot of the time you know Mm. like unless you're that top engineer creating their own little algorithm or piece of software that makes them a billionaire overnight but Mm. so that's kind of like if the rewards are there it's not that you should think that oh no i'm not the person that can do that like you can do it you just got to manage you might be more stressed about doing it so you might need a little more effort to build those, those more personable skills, you know, that, that yeah. make it less stressful. And, and, and in my head, I'm like, well, I, the, the, it's so much better financially. It's like, well, I've only got to do it for this period of time. You know? <laughs> like, so I can handle high stress for a, a decade or two decades, you know, like bring it on. You know? Yeah. It's, it's worth it. Yeah. Which is, which is so great about your situation. Cause it's, you know, cause it's, you know, the metaphor, it, you know, it, it's like a like a, a kind of a, a circular metaphor. You know, you've you conquered it in the surf, and then you've actually had to conquer it in an area that that's so foreign to you. That's that's almost the antithesis of of you know being out in the water and and it's just you and the elements. It's like it's that's just a whole other universe. But but it's a it's a classic metaphor for for your actual subject, which is you know how to how to yeah. mitigate and and, well, and deal deal with fear. It's like you're saying when you work with those audiences of like technically skilled engineers, then becoming managers or salespeople, like a lot of the time they've got to, to get to that next level, whether it's sort of financial reward, they've got to go to managerial positions and manage a a team of engineers. So they've got to build those skills, you know, Mm. not just sales skills. And I just identify with them really well because I'm like, we're all like the majority of us are all hyper introverted and and Mm. like the soft skills are really difficult to build and like being around people and the conversations and dealing with interpersonal conflicts and stuff is just not your cup of tea. So it's like, I find that nice. Like, and I think the audience likes it that, that we relate to each other on there because when I am just talking about surfing, it's very hard to relate what I'm doing in the surf world. You know, it's more relatable because I've, taken what I learned from the surf world and then applied it to something so foreign, but that is more related to them. Yeah. And I think that's why it kind of, it gets a better, um, I get better feedback because of that. Yeah, definitely. So, th- so the next thing I was going to ask you is, you know, what are three things that we can do to get better at situations where fear stops us? And we've, and I think we've covered one of them, which is, which is, you know, look at all of the different type scenarios that, that could occur that, 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 could range from the the single worst thing that could potentially happen and then manage the manage the the mitigation and the risk and the skill sets around those outcomes yeah um you know prepare w- prepare prepare and do some more preparation yeah, yeah. <laughs> kind of- so maybe that maybe they're the three things prepare prepare, <laughs> prepare. and <laughs> <laughs> and then if you're still anxious do some more preparation yeah <laughs> um is there anything else that that you know that that perhaps you know mentally that we can look at you know well like- i think if you like to just take it out of like my world of surfing and then bring it into like a corporate world a lot like a lot of the anxiety and stress that i see that comes about is job security right like and then not only like job security, which you basically have none of anymore in, in, especially here in Australia. And then, and then also like you might have a, let's say a, a tough boss, like a tyrant of a boss that you've got to deal with that overlooks your skill set or talk and all these different interpersonal conflicts, but you've got to like stay in this stressed out situation because there's no backup plan for you you know it's like if i leave this you're you you need that income so badly that you've got no other choice and you end up then becoming a slave to that career so i'm just like well when 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 i'm talking to people about this is like well well, what 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 does it take to create a, a sort of safety net where no matter what job you're in you can walk away at any time like it's going to give you all this negotiating power with the company that you work for because it's like when 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 your needs aren't met you can just go oh okay i don't need you i can walk away like and that's a level of comfort and overall life you know comfort that d- diminishes anxiety better than anything because in my head i'm like i know man i've got i need like two hundred thousand dollars right if i save that 
I ha can go get a cheap block of land somewhere and with the rest of the money build a sustainable thing where I, I can live a simple life, grow vegetables, eat that way and, and I've, I've spent $5, $10 a week for the rest of my life or whatever, you know, like I've got the backup plan. Hmm. You know? So then I don't have to stress so much that when things go wrong, you know, so it's like p people can create a, a backup plan to sort of give themselves some leverage in, in the negotiations of life, you know, but if you don't have the backup plan, you tie yourself into this crazy ball of debt. It's like, you're gonna get stressed. It's just not. Yeah. I, I, I think, no I think it. that, that message right there is, is incredibly powerful. It's like, cause you've taken it from, you know, from a, from a micro level, like, you know, paddling into a bloody double suck 15 foot, ship's turns right hand <laughs> to um you know to to a macro level which is okay so you know e e everyday life um you know you're in a you're in a a job that you're worried about losing well okay work on work on the scenario where if things do go pear-shaped what you know w work on a scenario where that's going to be okay yeah, or like it, it might not even just be a financial safety net, like an alter, alternate lifestyle. Like it, it might be that as part, or you might just be building like a whole different side set of skills. Yeah. And and pe like you try and get young people to do this, like just build a whole, like continually build that, that side set of skills so you can, you like the opportunity for you to be employed in multiple fields is there you've got a bigger broader choice of yeah you can go and work like it's tough when you try and tell someone who's got a mortgage three kids and and a full-time job where they're doing you know 50 60 hours a week to to then retrain skills it's not mm. impossible but it's tougher at that point but it's like just build all those different safety net that give you leverage with life yeah like, yeah so me so it's like because now that i have a career in public speaking and and i make a living off that all of a sudden my big wave surfing career stress is just is barely there because mm. i i don't have to do anything for my sponsors anymore like i'm like all right you know you don't want to sponsor me don't sponsor me I've, I've, i own money here you know and i can pick and choose what swells i want to go and surf what projects i want to do i don't feel beholden to no. to the added extra pressure of surfing big waves and getting results for a company, you know, like yeah. so all of a sudden all that stress is gone. And I'm just like, man, I wish I had a thought about that at the start of the career, you know, like it's, it's a, such a nice thing to have. And so if you can build that in any way in your life, then I think a, a broad scale of people's anxiety would, would drop a lot. Yeah. And I then, agree. Totally agree. In fact, it, you know, it was, uh, I'm, I, I keep thinking about, you know, there was, you know, when, when the unemployment, you know, really spiked, um, you know, a month or so ago and, and there was, there was this massive line and, you know, one, one of the, one of the reporters was Vox popping, you know, like just asking people in the line about what was going on. And, um, I said to this guy, you know, well, what's your story? And he said, Oh, I've got a food truck. And, um, I was, I was doing all of the, um, all of the, you know the, the the bands and the and the and the music festivals, and and I thought, mate, you've got a food truck. <laughs> <laughs> and and you could just see, you know, like and you know, like you know, I have compassion, absolutely, but but seemingly, you know, that guy doesn't have anyone in his life that could say, well, people are still going to want to eat. Yeah, you could drive your food safe. truck somewhere else, bro. Yeah, really. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think if he was truthful, he'd be like uh, seven fifty or five hundred a week's kind of better than what I was doing. So I'm maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe it was more than what he was so. making. But yeah. well, but, you know. well, not maybe not more than what he was making, but he's getting it for not working. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Is, I mean, that's, maybe that's just gonna wants be. It's going to be interesting to see what happens when they turn that tap off. Like, that's yeah, scary. really. Like, even for me, because I'm like, I've three like employees, and and that saved me. Like, as far as my outgoings, like, it's like, man, that's like a lifeline because my industry's gone. Like, I was, I know, ninety 
probably 95% of my income vanished overnight it was, and it was made illegal. Like you can run a conference. Yeah. And, and, and sure, like I'm pivoting, I'm doing stuff online, but that yeah. takes a long time to build up. So it certainly does. It's like that was such a lifeline, but it, it's going to be so interesting when that gets turned off, man, it's going to be a wild time. Yep. Yeah. It's going to be full on. That's what and, and there, the are, there are, and there is, there's a whole bunch of businesses that probably won't, be viable um, when they do turn that tap off, you know, yeah. like, so like travel is going to be just, you know, and a lot of restaurants, you know, unless they're really, you know, high margin expensive restaurants, like uh, they're, they're not going to be around and bars and, and those, all those hospitality joints, they all work on really skinny margins. So, so skinny. I, yeah, yeah they were saying here on the, uh, the Gold Coast, it'll be at least, like one in four, almost more than that won't reopen. Yeah. Like they're all kind of open now, but it's only with the support. Yeah. So there's going to be a lot of people out of work. Yeah, you know that. So, um, so mate, three books that you personally re- find yourself recommending a lot or, or, or give away as gifts that, um, that you think are really relevant to, to uh, our discussion today? I honestly like don't read all that much. <laughs> <'Cause> I, <laughs> I started when I read. I swear there's something wrong with my brain. I'm just so you don't have to smart. read aloud. <laughs> no, I, do, I read, but just not like I listen to things like I listen to podcasts. Oh, or, or audio books. Fine. Or, yeah, or, or podcasts. I watch lectures. You know? I watch like all kinds of things. Yeah, um, any, any particular people that you follow around the subject um, that so you think are worth hearing? Psychologist Jordan Peterson is. A yeah, he's awesome. He's yeah, probably yeah. Oh, he he's head and shoulders the best I've come across in the last fifteen years of yeah. of listening to psychologists and stuff, and I I, I find him fascinating. Yeah, so it fa- makes a I lot mean, of sense. Even to the point where I've done, I just sat through his entire lecture series on the Bible. It's like, oh wow! And I'm a most adverse person to religion ever, and I'm like, I the, you can listen to this biblical lecture series and it is mind-blowing wow yeah. Is, yeah he's he's pretty good he's definitely one worth watching and don't i mean a lot of people get caught up in the the shitty go that the mainstream media get, have given him yeah and um like uh he's been portrayed by them in a completely wrong light like yeah just give it give him a go and watch a little bit of his thing and you'll understand it yeah yeah no he's mate he's great he's got some yeah, great stuff He's probably awesome. And then he's got an amazing book list that's kind of like, that's uh, probably that would be the best book list to go on you know, yeah. to understand psychology. Um, rather than the booklet, like he, he has this thing, because I always try and get people that like they want help to overcome fear or like get their life in, a, in better shape. Mm-hmm. And I'm always like, well, what, what you need foundationally, like, cause well, I always say you got to want it more than your fear. The only way you can create that want or desire is first, like know yourself, like get to know yourself, mm-hmm. your skill set. you know, you can take IQ tests, personality trait tests, and just see where you are as an individual. Watch yourself for like a month or so mm-hmm. and see where the moments are in your life where time slips away. Yeah. Like, oh, I just really enjoyed doing that, you know? So get to know yourself over a month. And yep. then from there where you know yourself a little better, then make a plan of, of what to do, you know, like where do you want to go? And that long-term plan that might be, what does retirement look for, like for you across each aspect of your life? So what does it look like for you? What does your financial and career look like, you know, at, at 65? What is your family and personal life and relationships look like and then what is what do you want your health to be like at 65 and then all of a sudden you you know where you are and you've got somewhere to go you know and it's like from that having that makes you exponentially more resilient and and without that then every all the other stress relief techniques will barely work they're like tiny little band-aids on massive cuts that you're going to get, you know, like the, the, the way to become resilient is have that plan. And then uh, Jordan peace has got a really good um, platform. It's called, uh, I think it's understand myself or know myself. That's a personality trait. I've I've taken that. 
Yeah, there's that one. And then there, there's a self-authoring suite, which helps. I think I've done that one too. <laughs> create gold. Yeah, I, I just found those, those two things really beneficial. Like, yeah, they're, cool. They're awesome. just easy to point people towards and um, probably more beneficial than reading a book. Yeah. Because you know, you know how like you're reading, you're just taking the information in, but you're not always actioning the information you're getting. No, I'm true, a often. victim of that. I do that so much. Yeah. Definitely. You know, so they're better things rather than rather than reading. It'll just force yeah. you to actually do something. You know? Cool. So, um, so mate, thanks so much for being on. What's a way if you know someone's uh, you know listening today and they've and what what you've been sharing is resonating with them and they want to you know book you for a keynote. Hopefully, when we can all get back into a room together, or um, or even a virtual one. What's the best way for you to be contacted? Oh, just reach out to me on LinkedIn. It's yep. probably the, the best or hello at my... You're the only LinkedIn com. guy um, in, in, a, in a wetsuit with your profile photo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I actually changed that the other day. I was like, I should probably look a little more professional. And then someone <laughs> told me, like, you look really old in that new photo. I was like, can't win either way. No, no, no. You can't win. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think LinkedIn is probably the best. And then, yeah. or um, yeah, just hello at markmatthews.com. Matthews oh, yeah. with one T is an yep. email. It will go direct to me yep. and my um, assistant. If you need a keynote speaker, want to run a series of workshops, build resilience. Just uh, my, my whole thing is I want to help individuals access their potential. And yep. if I can, if you can build their resilience, then they have the opportunity to access their potential. And it's uh, I, I, in my, in my, um, like from my personal experience, uh, I don't think you can, you possibly know what your potential is. It could be so much greater than what you can actually even perceive yeah. if you can kind of build that resilience and push yourself to get there. Like that's what I feel like when I'm public speaking. It's like, man, there's no way I ever thought I'd be able to do that ever. Nah. And if you ask my English teacher, my parents, anyone, if, if I would ever be able to be a public speaker, they would laugh their head yeah, off. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. Good. Yeah. Go. <laughs> I, I, I had a teacher in primary school that told me I'd never, ever make any money out of surfing. <laughs> right? And, yeah. and, and, and probably I, I reckon 80, you know, 80% of my income has come from, um, from surfing. Really? Yeah. That's so good. Yeah. So if you good to bump into him. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, so anything I, I, I didn't ask you that I probably should have um, or that you were expecting me to ask you that I didn't? No, that's, we covered a fair bit there. Was a few different rants. I don't know. You could go down any avenue, yeah. elements, <laughs> you know, like it, I don't like that's the other part is when, when you say building resilience, overcoming fear, accessing potential, it's kind of, I always feel like the best thing to do is, like change things across multiple areas of performance in your life. So yep. it's not always just um, you might need new skill to be less stressed. You, you know, you might need to look physically at, at your health, you know, because a lot of your stress and anxiety can just be coming from the fact that you might be metabolically unhealthy and that's yeah, altering true. hormones, you know, like in your body. And then that's making you more stressed in every aspect of your life or it it might be like those interpersonal relationships that are actually the bedrock of your anxiety or stress you might just always think it's to do with work but it might be relationship so it's kind of like look at all those different areas yeah try and change little things positively across each of them and then yep. you get sort of uh, exponential sort of growth you know yeah Awesome. All right, mate. Well, we might wrap it up there, but um, thanks awesome. so much again. And, uh, mate, I'll have, we might have to have another chat because uh, that was fun. Yeah, too easy. We'll, we'll try a live one. Yeah, yeah, sounds good. <laughs> You've been listening to Master Dealmaker's Secrets with John Blake. Subscribe to get more in-depth strategies to maximize your sales process with new episodes every week and double your inquiry to sale conversion with the lead flow you already have. Go to johnblakeaudio.com for his exclusive free no-fluff audio training and companion PDF guide.